Send your scariest workplace stories to us at eeriecast.com slash submit. And rate and review Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Thanks. Hi, welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? Tonight, everyone's leaving early for an out-of-town work retreat. But I ain't going. And I'll give you two good reasons why. One, those things get gnarlier than a co-ed college slumber party. And two, a certain story I've heard that happened during a similar work-related getaway has me a bit too creeped out to join my coworkers. Oh, so you want to hear it? Fine by me. In fact, I have a load of other stories to share tonight as well. Haunted Uber rides, cursed statues, hospital horrors, and much more. Grab your favorite bag of coffee beans and join me. These are tales from the break room. The Triple Tragedy from Auntie TT. Choosing a career which places you in the hospital emergency department, you'd better expect the unexpected. Nearly 15 years in the ER and all of them on the graveyard shift, I saw some serious crap, some stuff I wish I could unsee. I was working my normal graveyard shift when we received two Trauma Clevelands from a multi-vehicle accident. Trauma Cleveland activations are traumas which result in death and or severe trauma with the likelihood of death. This incident was a husband and wife. They were older and had a grown-up son. When we got the husband and wife, it was not but a few minutes into their care when we realized that we would not be able to save the husband, and we had to pronounce his death. In the other trauma room was the wife. She was on the verge of death. She had severe head trauma and internal bleeding, and multiple chest traumas. She passed away the following day. Here's the creepy part of the story. While other members of the team were working on stabilizing the wife, the charge nurse and I went into the husband's room to prep him for the morgue. Upon entering the room, I noticed his feet were moving. And I don't mean moving like a twitch or something. I mean moving in different directions of each other, rapidly, as if this dead man was trying to get our attention. I quickly pointed this out to the charge RN. She brushed it off as post-mortem electrical spasms, or something like that. I turned on the monitor to make sure that he was indeed dead. There were no signs of cardiac activity. He was flatlined. I turned it off. I got ready to place the body in a body bag. I noticed again that the feet were still moving. I advised the charge nurse that I felt as if the husband's spirit was not ready to leave his wife. I asked her to pray with me. She was an atheist, and I knew that I was asking a lot of her. But on this occasion, she humored me, and we prayed over the body, asking God to take his spirit safely to heaven, telling the man to follow the light. At the end of the prayer, I told the man that we would take care of his wife for him and let his son know of the man's death. It was at that moment, his feet pointed straight up and went limp, falling towards the side. I felt like he was truly gone and therefore I felt much better about putting him in the body bag. By the time that I got back to the room from the morgue, the wife had been transported upstairs. Their adult son was in the same vehicle, thus part of the same accident, but he was transported to another local hospital, as it would have been hard on our ER to take three trauma Cleveland patients. During the time that we were helping the couple, their son called several times, asking for any updates on his parents. When our ER doctor was finally able to call the neighboring ER to let the son know of the status of his parents, he was told that the son had dropped dead. Though it appeared that the son had minor injuries, it turned out he had severe injuries to his heart. He literally dropped dead, pacing around his hospital room, awaiting news on his parents. All around, it was a tragedy of fate. Three members from one family, gone in a matter of hours. The Statue at the University From Spike I work at a big university in my city. 
I've actually sent in another story about a creepy ghost phone that would ring without being plugged in. This story in particular happened to me just the other day on my lunch break, and I believe this all happened because I touched something that I shouldn't have. I had decided to walk around and check out some pieces of artwork, including some statues that are in various places on campus. There is one large metal interactive statue called the Zipper that is able to be spun if you turn it, and as I walked past, I gave it a spin without thinking much about it. I stood and watched it for a while, then finished looking around at a few other things. After my break, I headed back to work to finish the day. I was happy, it was a Friday after all, and I only had a couple of hours left on my shift. Everything was normal and the day ended, and I went home. As soon as I got home, the weekend from hell began. First off, my dogs got sick at the same time for no apparent reason. Next, my giant tortoise, who lives in the yard, cut his foot open somehow, and he bled all over the place. If that wasn't enough, later that night, my dogs got sprayed by a skunk. In fact, it was so bad, their eyes swelled shut and they were foaming at the mouth and vomiting. This may not sound like much, compared to some of the other stories you might have heard. But it all happened at once, one thing after the other, and I started to feel like maybe I'd been cursed or something. After the weekend was over and things settled down somewhat, I went back to work on Monday and happened to see an Instagram story about the very same statue I had touched. Apparently, rumor has it, if you spin the statue, you will be followed by bad luck and misfortune. Students who have spun it have said that they failed exams or lost expensive textbooks and things like that. I put two and two together and realized I'd spun it on the Friday before the awful weekend. Thankfully, all my animals are better, and needless to say, I will never touch that thing again. In fact, they should go ahead and put a warning sign on it. My mom worked at a haunted school. From Cricket Girl 20. My mother worked at a haunted school before she met my dad. She worked there with a friend named Vernon, who in turn became my uncle when my mom got with his brother a few years later. My mom and Vernon would work at night, cleaning the school for the next day. They were employed by a cleaning service of some sort. The thing is, before and while they were working there, there was a rash number of suicides, a few fatal accidents too, and a couple of unexplained deaths. One of the poor souls who died there was a janitor who hanged himself on the playground. One night, my mom and Vernon were cleaning the gym. Vernon decided to start a conversation. Hey Mary, how's Michael doing? The sudden sound of his voice startled my mom. Jeez, Vernon, that came out of nowhere. I mean, this place gives me the creeps. Ever since that janitor hung himself a few weeks ago. Anyway, uh, Michael's fine. He's a good kid. Suddenly, a loud bang came from the other side of the school. Vernon looked at my mother and said, Well, uh... We're going to have to go see what that was. So the two of them began to venture slowly to the other side of the school. Vernon noticed my mom looked scared and asked, You okay? They then heard another loud bang suddenly. They walked around the corner and found a classroom door open. My mom said then, Vernon, I thought we locked all the doors already. I, I don't know. I thought we did too. He reached out to close the door, but in an instant, it slammed shut in his face, hitting his nose so hard my mother could hear the bone break. Vernon stumbled backwards, grabbing at his nose after the door slammed. He yelled curses, shouting that his nose was broken. Then they heard the sound of running footsteps all around them. They looked down the hall, and they saw this dark shadow watching them in the distance. They both basically flew out of that building, leaving all the supplies in there. They got back in the van and sped away. Before taking Vernon to the hospital, they each left a separate voicemail on their boss's phone. Something along the lines of, We quit. After what we saw in that school, we're not coming back. 
Much later, when my mom got back to the office, she left the van and the keys in the parking lot. She got in her car and went home. My mom and Vernon stayed friends until the day she passed, but Vernon doesn't like talking about that night. Every time the topic of ghosts comes up, he gets wide-eyed and leaves the room. Downtown Hotel From Jaff This happened in 2017. I was 20 years old at the time. I worked the night shift at a hotel in Fort McMurray, Alberta. It was around 3 a.m. when a man came in to get a room. That's not really strange. We were downtown, and it was the weekend. People often come and go all hours of the night. As I was helping him in, I noticed he was staring at something behind me, and he kept mumbling to himself. I asked him what was wrong, and he said something so weird. There's a bunch of flies flying behind you. He pointed behind me and questioned me if I saw it as well. This freaked me out a bit and confused me. When I turned around, all I saw was just a wall. I looked back at him and freaked out a bit more, because I could tell how very uncomfortable he was. Something was clearly bothering him. He kept insisting that flies were everywhere and that they kept following me. Before long, he began to say that the fly swarm was getting bigger and bigger. I'm about done with this guy, thinking he was just crazy. I gave him the room he requested, just so I could get him out of the reception area. Once he was gone, after a couple of hours, an ambulance drove up and paramedics came in going to the guy's room. I never really did find out what went on, but when I asked security to check the room to see if there was any damage, security came back and told me that the room was spotless. In fact, it looked as if the bed hadn't been used. After the incident, every time I'm alone and go to the bathroom, it feels like someone's watching me there. The shift this happened on goes from 11pm to 7am, and I would be working all by myself except for security, but they work separately, looking at cameras and doing their rounds. A couple of months after this, I left the job. I never could shake the feeling someone was watching me. I wonder if something that was attached to that man stuck with me. Abandoned Factory From Rio I never thought I'd find myself working the night shift at an old abandoned factory. But desperate times call for desperate measures, and with bills piling up and a mortgage that seemed to grow larger every day, I had to take whatever job I could get. I couldn't afford to be picky. The place I found myself at had a sinister reputation among the locals. Rumors abound of accidents, disappearances, and strange occurrences but I brushed off these stories as just the product of overactive imaginations. I was wrong. The first night there on the job was eerie. The factory was quite vast, with long, dimly lit corridors that seemed to stretch into infinity. The air was thick with a musty smell, a combination of rust, dampness, and neglect. As I walked through the echoing halls, the distant sound of dripping water seemed to follow me wherever I went, like the footsteps of an invisible companion. But I focused on my tasks, trying to drown out the creeping unease that was starting to settle in. The machines, relics of a bygone era, creaked and groaned as though they were awakening from a long slumber. Every now and then I thought I heard faint whispering, like the factory walls were trying to convey some long-forgotten secrets. As the night wore on, the darkness seemed to press in even more, making every shadow feel like it was moving. I could not shake the feeling I was being watched. On several occasions, I turned around quickly, only to find nothing but empty hallways and the occasional rat scurrying away. During one of my rounds... I reached the basement level. 
The air was colder down there, and an uneasy feeling settled in the pit of my stomach. As I walked past rows of old storage shelves, I noticed a faint light flickering in the distance. Curiosity got the better of me, so I followed the light through a narrow passage. What I stumbled upon will forever haunt my dreams. In a small chamber, illuminated by a single flickering bulb, I found a collection of old dusty dolls. These dolls were arranged in a circle, their glass eyes reflecting the feeble light in an unsettling way. But what really sent a shiver down my spine was the fact that the dolls seemed to be whispering to each other, because I could hear their voices, soft and barely audible. I stumbled back, my heart racing, and fled from that chamber as though the very air around me had turned toxic. I knew I had to leave the place. There was something deeply wrong about it. As I retraced my steps through the labyrinthine corridors, I realized the factory itself seemed to be shifting, rearranging itself in a way to confound and trap me. I ran, the sound of my own footsteps echoing in my ears, a cacophony of whispers now joining in. Soon, I found my way out. I burst through the factory doors, gasping for air, and I didn't look back until I was several blocks away. I quit that job the next day, never returning to the accursed factory. But, even now, as I sit in the safety of my home, I can't escape the feeling that something may have followed me from there. The doll's whispers haunt my dreams, a constant reminder that some places are best left abandoned, some stories best left untold. I learned the hard way. On Patrol From Alex That night had been quiet, and the city I was working in nestled in the south of Germany, was peaceful. The narrow cobblestone streets, the small historic buildings, and the black forest surrounding the city had always given the place a fairy tale like quality. I'm a police officer. It was on a regular night patrol with my partner Clara. We were accustomed to the usual drunken disturbances, fights, traffic incidents, and so on. But as the job is, there are always new situations, and that night, we were dispatched to a case I will not forget so easily. The radio crackled, and we received a dispatch. A neighbor reported seeing lights inside a house next door, which was odd, because she was sure the homeowners were away on vacation. The possibility of an ongoing break-in was high at this point. We did have break-ins around here every once in a while, Oftentimes, people found their homes ransacked when coming home from vacation or work. Clara and I exchanged a glance. We knew the neighborhood well. It was typically quiet, with low crime rates. Backup was dispatched, and before we knew it, another patrol car with officers Lucas and Lena had joined us. Our cars quietly rolled up to the dimly lit street, where the house in question stood. The building was a three-story townhouse, old, with ivy crawling up the side. The lights inside flickered inconsistently, like someone was moving around with a flashlight. Without needing to discuss, we naturally split into two teams. Lucas and Lena took position outside, ensuring no one got out, while Clara and I cautiously approached the entrance. I gently tried the door handle. It was unlocked. With a slow turn, we silently stepped inside, our flashlights scanning the surroundings. The ground floor looked undisturbed, with a tidy living room and a quaint kitchen, where a window stood open. As we made our way up to the narrow staircase, we began to hear muffled noises. This sounded like soft weeping, interspersed with erratic muttering. With every step, the tension in the air grew thicker, we communicated with short, silent gestures, anticipating each other's movements. 
The second floor had three doors, two of which were slightly ajar. The sobbing sound seemed to be coming from behind the third, which was closed. As I approached, ready to confront whoever was behind the door, a loud crash from the top floor caught our attention. Clara signaled for me to stay put while she ascended to the third floor to investigate. I stayed on the second, hand on the grip of my weapon, ready for any unexpected moves from behind that closed door. I carefully pushed the door open. The bedroom was dimly lit by the city's ambient light filtering through the sheer curtains. In the center of the room was a man, probably in his mid-thirties. His eyes darted all over, reflecting fear and confusion. He fidgeted with a broken toy, mumbling to himself. It became clear that he might be struggling with some sort of mental illness or drugs. I called to him softly. I'm with the police. We're here to help. I kept my voice calm, trying to diffuse the situation. His head snapped towards me, and for a moment, his eyes locked onto mine. The vulnerability and terror in them was palpable. It was in that silent exchange that I felt an overwhelming sadness. Suddenly, I heard a loud shout from above, breaking the silence. The man in front of me grew agitated, and I could hear Clara's voice calling for backup. The situation was escalating. The man's gaze darted from me to the ceiling, clearly unnerved by the noise above. His fingers clenched the broken toy lighter, his knuckles white, I took a deep, silent breath. With a sense of urgency, I yelled down for Lena and Lucas to come inside and watch this man. As they rushed in, I dashed up the stairs, fearing for Clara's safety. Reaching the third floor, I found Clara in a struggle with another man. The dude was taller, wiry, and surprisingly strong. His eyes had the same distant, terrified look as the man downstairs. Clara was trying to restrain him, but the guy was frantic, pulling and twisting. Just as they fell to the floor, I jumped into the fray, helping Clara to pin the man down. As we struggled, he was screaming something incomprehensible at the top of his lungs. With combined effort, we managed to restrain him, ensuring he was neither a threat to us nor to himself. Catching our breaths, Clara and I traded worried glances, realizing that we were dealing with two individuals who seemed to be in throes of a severe mental health crisis. Downstairs, Lucas and Lena had managed to calm the first man down, talking to him gently and ensuring he felt safe. The contrast of the tense atmosphere upstairs and the semblance of calm downstairs was surreal. With the situation under control, we began the task of escorting both of the handcuffed men outside. The night was quiet, the streets empty, the black forest looming in the distance, silently watching the drama unfold. The man from upstairs had turned quiet, not uttering another word. The man from the bedroom was still murmuring something incomprehensible to himself. Once outside, before the transport, we searched the men. I was briefly in a trance as I pulled up the pant leg of the man with whom Clara and I had fought a few minutes earlier. I found a long, sharp kitchen knife hidden in the long sock he was wearing. It hit me like a blow how lucky the two of us had been. That situation could have ended quite differently. The drive back to the station was quiet. The weight of the night's events bore heavily on all of us reminding us of the danger the job entails. Later that night, we were able to identify these two men, bringing them back to a psychiatric facility where they hopefully got the help they needed. But we never did find out the reason they broke into that house. Nishi From Ravana I work for an IT company in Chennai, India. Recently, one of my coworkers got engaged to another colleague in our office. This man hailed from North India, 
specifically Bengali, and his birthplace was a rural village in West Bengal. He extended an invitation to everyone in the office, including me. However, most of my co-workers couldn't attend, so my branch manager and I decided to represent our office at the wedding. He booked our tickets, and we planned to arrive at the wedding destination five days before the event. We opted for an early arrival because neither of us was familiar with the state. As we reached our destination, it was a rural village, but it had all the necessities. His house was vast, offering guest rooms for us to settle into comfortably. My friend was engrossed in wedding preparations, leaving us with little to do. On the third night, my manager and I found ourselves bored, so we decided to embark on a small adventure, a visit to a nearby famous cave, which was apparently renowned for being haunted. We planned to head over there in the evening after 4 p.m. Our friend's father, who was the village leader, issued us a stern warning, stating we should return before 10 p.m. The cave itself was only a 30-minute drive away, so that part posed no problems. We visited the cave and the surrounding lake, but there was nothing particularly eerie about the place. That cave lacked the haunted atmosphere we had expected, so before long, we decided to leave. As we drove along the highway, we were stopped by a police patrol. They informed us of a major accident on that road and suggested an alternate route back to the village. With no other options, we followed their directions. This new path led us to a remote village where phone services were unreliable. Our car suddenly sputtered to a stop, the engine smoking. We were now stranded in the middle of the road, darkness encroaching and dense forest on either side. The main village was just a 20-minute walk away, so we decided to make the journey on foot. As we walked, we chatted about various mundane topics when an inexplicable chill swept over me. It felt as though someone was watching the two of us. I dismissed it as my imagination until I heard someone clearly calling my name, and the voice actually sounded like my office crush. That couldn't be right. She wouldn't be attending the wedding due to a medical condition which prohibited her from traveling. Startled, I attempted to turn back, but my manager stopped me abruptly, and now his face was a mask of pure terror. There was no doubt he had heard a voice too, possibly the same one. He motioned for me to keep walking forward, and we continued. The voice persisted, growing louder and more desperate as we approached the village. Finally, we spotted the light emanating from a shop at the village's far end, and all at once the voice stopped. We sought help from the locals, and after the wedding, my manager and our friend's dad explained what had occurred. We had encountered Nishi, a famous urban legend in the area. Nishi is said to call out your name when you travel alone at night, mimicking the voices of your loved ones. If you were to look back, Nishi would instantly attack, killing you, or at least driving you to madness. My manager had prior knowledge of this legend through books and podcasts, which is why he knew how dangerous it could be. I still wonder what would have happened if I hadn't been accompanied by my manager that night. If he never stopped me from looking back, I may not be here today. Facts from the Unknown From Mike I've been holding onto this weird story for a while now, but after talking to my mates at the pub the other night, I figured, why not just toss it out here and see if any of you can make sense of it? You ever have one of those moments at work where something just doesn't add up, and no matter how many ways you twist and turn it, it's just odd? Well, here it is. Back in the day, I worked in this cramped old office building downtown. It had a very old school vibe. You know the type. Dusty corners, creaky floorboards, a temperamental elevator, 
that looked like it was straight out of an old horror film. But the weirdest bit was this ancient fax machine we had. You probably remember them, the big, clunky machines that sped out paper like it was going out of style. Yep, that's the one. One day I was burning the midnight oil, trying to finish a report. Just me and the security guard, Dave. Dave's cool. He would do his rounds, and every now and then, we would chat about football or some show we were watching. That night, he had just finished telling me about his kid's school play, and had gone on his usual patrol. I was typing away, when suddenly that dang fax machine sprang to life. It started to spit out sheets. I walked over, thinking maybe the boss had forgotten something and was sending it through late. I took a look and nothing, except for a bunch of squiggles, lines, and shapes that looked vaguely like, I don't know, primitive drawings? Maybe like cave paintings? And then this sentence, clear as day in the middle of it all. Is anyone there? Pretty freaky, right? But I chalked it up to some weird glitch, or maybe even a prank. Still, it was kind of eerie being in that room with just that machine and those weird drawings. Dave came back and I showed everything to him. He didn't make much of it, just joking that maybe the office was built on some old burial ground. We laughed it off together. Here's where it gets weirder, though. The next day, I showed it to a couple of co-workers. No one could make sense of it. But one of the older gents, Barry, his face went a shade paler when he saw it. He claimed that back when he first started at the company, way before I was even born, the same thing had happened. Late night, a few people in the building, and the fax machine spitting out those same drawings, that same sentence. Barry always thought it was just a strange memory, or even a dream, until now. Thing is, no one could ever explain it. The company that made that fax machine was long out of business. We had no idea who could be sending it, or from where. And why the drawings? Why that sentence? We eventually replaced the machine, and the whole incident sort of faded into workplace legend. But, every so often, when someone new comes in and gets stuck working late, I'd show them the drawings, just to see their reaction. Guess it's just one of those unexplainable things, but I still think about it from time to time. What did that message mean, and who or what was trying to communicate with us? And why us? Still creeps me out when I think about it. Coworker Visit From Beyond From Jared S. Smelker I've been working at a big box home improvement store for the last 13 years. It's been a good job, and I've had the pleasure of working with many great people. In my time with the company, I've worked with a few co-workers that have passed on. Not at work, but still their passing was difficult for us who once worked side by side with them. Although they passed, one still showed up for work from time to time. In 2012, a sales specialist passed away at his home in an unfortunate accident. He was always known to have a great sense of humor and loved to play practical jokes on his friends and co-workers. One day, a few months after passing, he made his presence known at the store, and those of us who knew him had no doubt it was him visiting us. Here are three incidents that all happened on the same day. The opening manager opened the store one day around 4 a.m. He entered the store with a large cup of gas station coffee, like he did every morning. As he walked towards the back of the store, his coffee cup came right out of his hands and crashed to the ground, making a mess. When asked what happened, he stated that he did not simply drop the coffee, but he had felt someone hit the bottom of his cup. The cup popped out of his hands and fell. This manager used to manage the employee that passed away and knew him very well. He stated that many times while carrying his coffee, this employee used to joke with him about popping the cup 
out of his hands. The manager had no doubt this was the spirit of that employee. About two hours after the coffee incident, a freight associate was putting away items in the caulk and paint aisle. He stated when he left the aisle, he was done putting items away, and at the time there was nothing on the floor. A few moments later, he re-entered the aisle, and three tubes of caulk were lying on the floor. These specific tubes were lying down on the shelf, not standing up. There's no physical way for them to roll off that way. This last event sends chills down my spine, because I saw it on video. I watched it over and over again, and have no doubt this was a spirit incident, not something simply falling off a shelf. A female associate was talking to a male associate in an aisle. She was standing near an end cap shelf that held gallon and quart cans of stain. Out of nowhere, a quart size can flew off the shelf and onto the ground spilling. No associates were touching the shelving, and no power equipment was nearby operating, so no vibrations. All those cans were nowhere near the edge of the shelf. All of them were at least an inch or more on the shelf, away from the edge. And it wasn't the can closest to the female associate, it was the third one in. I talked to all the employees involved. There was no doubt it was the deceased employee playing pranks on everyone. All three incidents were on the same day, as I said, and even happened within hours of each other. In the end, we're happy to know that even in the afterlife, a sense of humor can still be had. The Haunting of the Willow From Sonora Recently, while I was working at a small local motel, I got to talking to the hotel's maintenance manager. He told me an interesting story about the time he worked in the kitchen in this famous haunted hotel and restaurant just down the block from where we were. In our small historic gold rush town, located in the Sierra foothills of Northern California, there's a pretty famous restaurant and hotel that was named after the willow trees growing in the area. This particular place had been featured on TV shows, like Sightings, and had also been visited by ghost hunter Frank Nosorino. This is because of the simple fact that, like I said, it's pretty haunted. The Willow Steakhouse and Saloon was established in 1862. Shortly thereafter, it became one of the leading hotels in Tuolumne County, California, even being referred to as the leading hostelry at the gateway to the motherlode. The hotel was said to have housed many people, like dignitaries and wealthy businessmen, and even gunslingers like Bat Masterson. In 1973, a man staying in the Willow Hotel said that he awoke in the middle of the night to see a little gray guy standing near the door to the room, about six feet away from his bed. According to the startled man, this ghost was bald on the top of his head, with a little fringe of hair around the edges. He said the ghost appeared to be wearing a bathrobe over his pajamas, and that he disappeared within a matter of seconds of having appeared. The reason for the haunting of the willow is rumored to be due to the place being struck by five mysterious fires, but the two most significant fires took place in 1975 and 1982. Both of these fires nearly destroyed the place, and they're rumored to have been started by ghosts themselves. The popular belief is that the reason for the fires supposedly set by vengeful arson-minded spirits may be because of a fire that nearly took out the small town in 1896, before the Willow was well established. You see, that fire took nine buildings out in its wake, as it burned closer and closer to the Willow. Unfortunately, the town did not have the water to fight the fires, so they had to use dynamite of all things, in order to extinguish the massive flames. So basically, the theory is that the dead may be resentful of the fact the rest of the town was blown up just to save the willow. Now that the history of this haunted place is out of the way, we can get on to the story. According to the maintenance manager, 
He was once assigned the duty of dishwasher in the restaurant part of the hotel. On many occasions, he told me his co-workers would speak of some of their minor experiences at least a couple of times a week. As for himself, he did share a few spooky experiences that he had while working in the kitchen there. In fact, that's the main reason for him deciding to leave his kitchen position in the hotel. The first experience he had only seemed to spook him a little. One night on one of his first shifts, he had to go into the back part of the kitchen where the dry food storage was near closing time. As he was digging around on one of the bottom shelves near the very back of the area, he swore that he heard the sound of footsteps coming towards him from the kitchen. But when he glanced over his shoulder to see who it was, he saw nothing and no one. Then he swears he heard a sound, almost like something soft and heavy being dropped to the floor. The second experience was a little more serious, however, and it actually did scare him a bit. As he was doing some closing cleaning duties by himself in the kitchen one night, he happened to catch a sort of shadowy movement out of the corner of his eye. When he looked over to see exactly what it was, he said he saw a shadowy-like figure standing there for about a split second until it suddenly darted out of sight, seemingly through the wall. That was freaky on its own, but what happened next was truly next level. As he watched, one of his co-workers, the dishwasher, happened to walk into the kitchen area from the dining area. Just as the dishwasher entered the kitchen, however, he was suddenly debilitated with a terrible headache. This was made obvious by the way that he suddenly gripped the edge of the prep counter and squeezed just above his eyes as he bowed his head in pain. Just as that was happening, a sudden loud noise came from the back food storage area. As he and his coworker ran back to investigate, they discovered an entire metal shelving unit full of plates and bowls had been tipped over somehow and was leaning against the opposite wall after having fell about three quarters of the way over. Now his final experience before deciding to quit the kitchen was a scary one. On a particularly busy night in the restaurant, he and a couple other co-workers cooked away in the busy kitchen. On one side of the cook line stood a tall metal shelving unit, which was where the dishwasher would stack all the clean plates and bowls and stuff. All of a sudden, plates from the top of each of the four or five stacks started to fly off one by one. The kitchen staff could do nothing but stare in terror and disbelief, as one by one, plates smashed into the far wall of the kitchen above the prep sinks, instantly flying into pieces. This only went on for a few more seconds, but it was long enough to absolutely clear that kitchen out. All the kitchen staff practically ran each other over, trying to get out of the back door fast. After that, like I said, the maintenance manager quit his kitchen duties. As for the rest of the kitchen staff, he simply guessed they all quit in their own time. Eventually, anyways. My Godfather's Job as an Uber Driver From Cricket Girl 20 My Godfather Scotty used to work as an Uber driver back in 2018. He only started doing Uber to bring in extra money. He drove at night, He's not really a daytime person. On his first night, he took a request to pick someone up from a club. He got to the club and saw a young lady waving him down. He asked, Did you order an Uber? She said yes and got into the front seat. Then he saw a man running out of the club, screaming something along the lines of, Get back here. Panicked, the lady screamed, Go, please, now! Scotty pressed the gas and drove out of the parking lot, while the man fell flat on his face because of how drunk he was. As he drove, Scotty asked her, Are you okay? The young lady explained, That was my ex-boyfriend. He thinks he owns me, he's violent and an alcoholic. The address she gave him was apparently her cousin's place. She gave Scotty a generous $100 tip, telling him thank you and God bless. 
Scotty was obviously freaked out. Once he got home, he called and told me about it. Fast forward a week, I was riding with him to keep him company on the job. My godfather and I are close, so we joked around. Suddenly, a request popped up on his phone that someone needed to be picked up. We drove over to the location, which was apparently a closed gas station. A young man stood there and smiled when he saw us pull up. The address he had put in to be dropped off at was a farmhouse on a dirt road. We struck up conversation with him. He was a fairly good-looking guy, and he had a country accent. I asked him, so is your accent natural, or did you just pick it up? Yes, ma'am, he said. All natural. He had gorgeous blue eyes and spiky brown hair. As we pulled up to the address, my godfather and I both looked in the back seat, and he was gone. And I mean completely gone. Scotty slammed on the brakes. We looked at each other then, and I asked him, Scotty, you saw him, right? You saw him get in the car, right? Scotty replied, Yeah, I, I did. The back door never opened either. So how on earth did he get out? I then said, Even if he did get out, the car was moving. He would have hurt himself. We were freaked out. And as we looked up at the destination, the farmhouse... It was completely in ruins. The roof had caved in long ago. I looked over at Scotty and said, I think we picked up a ghost. Scotty is not easy to scare, but the look on his face spoke for itself. He was absolutely creeped out. Scotty turned his Uber app off and we drove back to his house in silence. When we got back, he grabbed a beer and gave me some soda as I was 16 at the time. He asked, Cricket, have you ever seen a ghost before? I replied, I think so, but having one disappear from a moving car is something new to me. Eventually, when Scotty drove me back home, I jokingly told him, Watch out for ghosts. A month after that, I was riding with Scotty again, this time in the daytime. He accepted a request at one point, and right away the person texted Scotty, asking if he could put his powder in the trunk. Now we knew what he meant by powder, from experiences we both had seeing our relatives buzzed on the powder. Scotty cancelled the ride and said, That's it. I'm done with Uber. My main job is enough for me. He drove me home that day and he still works at his main job as an eyeglass seller. Be careful when you drive for Uber. Strange and scary things can often happen. Hospital Haunting From Paranormal Nurse I had a couple of experiences at a hospital that I used to work at. Hospitals can be very active and have tons of potential for ghost activity. About seven years ago, I was working in a small rural hospital as a registered nurse. The hospital was fairly new back then, built only about four years prior. It had a wing for regular patients and a wing for prisoners who would be brought in from the prison that was located in the town. The prison wing would only be opened and used if there were five or more prisoners admitted. This way, the non-prisoner wing would not fill up with prisoners, making the other patients and their families uncomfortable. I worked the night shift, 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., and because this hospital was small and rural, there weren't really people or family members walking around the hospital during the night, as you might see in larger, busier hospitals. A lab was located in the hospital that blood samples and the like were taken to. If I had time during my shifts, I would run stuff to the lab between downtime to help out our CNAs. There had been times that I had to run to the prisoner wing alone to get some supplies or meds, and the first few times I had to, I was super creeped out. There's something about the air and the feel in there that would freak me out. I got the feeling like I was being watched, so I would hurry so I could get in and get the heck out ASAP. After the first few times going there alone, I always made someone come with me if I had to grab anything. 
One night while walking to the lab alone, I passed by the prisoner wing entrance, which was dark and empty. The doors had been left open, which consisted of a sliding bar door that locked in front of a thick solid metal locking door, just like you would see in an actual prison. You could always feel a creepy feeling in and near the unit. No big deal, just walk fast like one of those mall walkers and get past it quickly. On my way back to my unit from the lab, again, I passed by the entrance to the prisoner wing. This time as I passed by, I heard someone whistling a tune. I slowed down and did a quick two-second peek through the doorway. Like before, it was dark and empty. No staff inside. So who would be in there, in the dark, and whistling like that? I know who, I thought. Nobody. So I hauled tail back to my unit and told a couple of my co-workers, who believed me but hadn't experienced anything themselves there. Fast forward a couple of months. It was during the summertime when our patient load decreased significantly to mostly just locals. Wintertime is a lot busier because of all the snowbirds. Our unit has 20 beds, but on this night, we had only about half that many patients. When you walk into the unit, which has an oval shape floor plan, the nurse's station is directly in front of you, and you have the patient rooms on your right and left sides, with each side being a hallway with 10 rooms going down it, with a nurse's station in the back. Each patient room had a glass front, like an ICU room, so you could see inside the room if the curtain was open. Empty rooms have the curtains open, and most patients' rooms have them closed, for the patient's privacy. This night, the patients were placed in the rooms towards the front of the unit, where the entrance was, for patient safety. And most of the staff, the nurses and CNAs, stayed at the nurse's station in the front. One of my CNAs, who was assigned to my patients, ended up sitting in the back nurse's station because she needed a computer to chart on. I went to the back where she was sitting, and I was standing on the outside of the counter so I could face her directly and speak to her while she was sitting in front of me. As I stood there talking to her, I looked over her head at the empty patient rooms behind her. As we chatted, I had to stop. I'm pretty sure I stopped mid-sentence and my mouth just stayed open. I saw a man with a patient gown on walk from one side of an empty room to the other. I saw him, a full apparition, go from one end to the other and I knew that those rooms were all empty. The CNA, watching my face, started loudly saying, What? What's going on? And she jumped up thinking that someone was behind her trying to spook her. I then told her, not so calmly, that I saw a man in room 113. I went to tell the other nurses. One of them checked to see if a patient had died in that room, but there was no record of that. The beds in all the rooms are ICU beds, and used for ICU and non-ICU patients. We wondered if maybe it was the bed, maybe a patient had died on it, but there was no way to check that. That was the topic of the night, and it really amped all of us up. A few hours later, the little old house cleaning lady came in to clean some stuff, and overheard us talking about the apparition I saw. She wanted to share her story and began to tell us what she experiences when she cleans the prison wing. She told us that when she cleans the prison wing by herself, she often hears whistling. I was like, holy crap, I heard the whistling coming from in there a few months back. This completely validated my experience. When I first started, there was one particular room that was up by the front nurse's station that would catch my eye. There were times that I would be charting at one of the computers that faced that room, or walking by that room and out of the corner of my eye, I would see what looked to be a man standing in the doorway. When I would look right at it, it would be gone. But it was there, in my peripheral. I told one of the nurses who had worked there for a while, and she told me that a male patient had recently passed away in that room. 
These experiences were not my first experiences with ghosts or the paranormal. I'm still working as a nurse, and I've definitely worked in many other places where there are ghosts and paranormal happenings. Mysteries of the Goldwell Open Air Museum From Scoobs I'm an artist, and I really enjoyed expressing myself in places far from civilization, so I found myself in odd locations fairly often. One weekend, I was staying at the Goldwell Open Air Museum's Art Center. When I first arrived, I found the art, view, and overall atmosphere intoxicating, so I was expecting a great trip. However, things got weird as the sun started to go down. I felt the air change. I can't really describe it, but it felt heavy and had a weird smell to it. I tried not to think too much of it. I just turned my light on and continued working on my painting. I worked for a couple of hours and got done around 11.30 p.m. So I stepped outside my RV to smoke a little joint that I'd brought with me beforehand. I sparked up and stargazed for a while, thinking about tomorrow and what may come of it. Eventually, I flicked it and turned around to go back inside, but the second I did, I could not shake the feeling of being watched. I felt the hairs on my neck stand up like a hyena, so I bolted in my RV and locked the door. I can't really tell you why it scared me so much, but my buzz was gone by then, and I was awake for another hour before eventually dozing off. I woke up paranoid, but the next day was uneventful. I painted and took in the views as the hours passed. Everything really was quite boring in a good way, until the sun lowered again. I really wish I'd driven far away from there the second I woke up. I could feel something bad coming. The sun fully set, and I locked myself in the coachman, praying that I was just being paranoid. But as the night went on, I started to hear some animal out in the distance. The sound was strange. I've been in many places that are secluded. I've heard plenty of coyotes and mountain lions and more. But this was something different. It was piercing and guttural. It felt like nails on a chalkboard. But I couldn't pinpoint where it was coming from. It was like it was coming from multiple places. But it also felt like they were all directed at me for some reason. It was quite bone-chilling. I was panicking so much, I couldn't move to drive the RV. Not that I even thought to at the moment. These noises gradually grew closer and closer, like they were circling in. This thing, or things, were stalking me. The screaming got so loud, it felt like it was feet away from me. Then suddenly, full stop, complete silence. I still didn't move, but it made me feel somewhat better. Then, the RV began to shake back and forth. Something, or multiple things, were rocking it side to side. I didn't know what to do, so I just held on, trying not to make any sound. Eventually, it all stopped. But then, I heard something jump on the roof. It began clawing at the top of my coachman. That sound rings in my ears to this very day and never stops. The sound continued until I felt a large shift in the RV, then nothing. I'm lucky to say that was the end of the encounter, and the last weird encounter with whatever that was. I did not get any sleep that night. But the moment the sun came up, I hauled myself out of there. I'm never going back, and this incident has made me reevaluate creating art in remote locations. Tales from the Break Room is a viewer submitted podcast featuring allegedly true scary stories that happened on the way to, on the way from, or at work. If you want your story to be narrated on the show, send it to us at eeriecast.com slash submit. As of April 14th, we're paying three cents per word for stories that are approved and make it onto the show. Submission does not guarantee approval or payment. 
For a limited time only, PayPal only. Tales from the Break Room is an EerieCast Network original podcast hosted by Darkness Prevails. You can follow him on Twitter at Dark Prevails, and you can hear thousands more stories read by him on our other show, Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed this episode, please follow and rate Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You can also enjoy plenty more horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com. <laughs>